Jigwitch and welcome back to the Genesis study. I have heard some preachers um, who've been preaching for a while talk about how they've preached through the entire Bible. And I'm always in amazement when I hear this because I'd like to preach through the entire Bible before I'm done. And I, I think, how, how have they managed that? How have they done that? And so I look at their the stuff they've posted online and their studies will be like, Genesis chapter 1 to 27. And I'm like, oh, that's how you did it. But we're not doing that here. We are taking our time in our study. And I think that's proven by the fact that this is part 19. By the end of this video, there will be about 10 hours up of our Genesis study so far. And after all of that, we're only now coming to the end of chapter 1. So we really are taking our time, but I think it's worth it because God's word is so full and it has so much uh, wonderful wisdom and insight in it. So today we are doing, as I say, chapter 1, verses 28 to 31. So we are finishing out the chapter today. So I'll read it for you first. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. And fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed and its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. There was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. This is what I have called the uh, climax of creation, the crescendo. This is the end of the creation part of the creation week. This isn't the end of the creation week. This is only the end of day six. We've still got day seven. And there's no creating in day seven, but it is still part of the week, and we will discuss that next time. But as for now, like I say, we're only on day six and we've been a little while on day six now. Um, last time we only covered about half of verse 28 and we spoke about three blessings in that verse. We talk, spoke about our rights over the earth and our responsibilities and we're sort of going to pick up there. So we have dominion over the earth as this verse tells us. We have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now what this means is pretty much just a long-winded way of saying everything, every animal. So you can't be too persnickety and say, well, the bat isn't a bird, but it's in the sky, so do we have dominion over that? Or something silly like that, there's no room for that. This just means everything. Everything in the water, everything in the sky, everything on the land. From horses, to monkeys, to fish, to penguins, to anything but as i discussed last time with the rights we have over those animals come certain responsibilities we have rights over these animals we cannot abuse them in any way and there are so many different ways that animals can be abused um, they can be abused for people's own pleasure some people derive some sick pleasure out of seeing animals in pain now, while animals are not people, animals do not have a conscience like us. Animals are not on the same levels as human beings. Animals are still living creatures, and I think there is a certain level of dignity and respect that comes with that, inherently. So while I'm not a vegan or a vegetarian, and while I do eat meat, and I believe that it is the right of every human to eat meat, there is still a certain respect that animals must be shown. They cannot be abused. They are a gift from God and we cannot abuse God's gifts. One way, like I say, that they are abused is for people's sick pleasure. People enjoy seeing them in pain. And by the way, there is a very strong correlation with people who enjoy hurting animals and people who will then go on to kill or hurt other people. But animals also get abused in other ways. In researching for certain drugs and medicine and so on, animals can be abused. They can be harmed and essentially tortured. And while to a degree this is necessary, I think there is a larger question there about the ethics of such a thing, about pushing a living thing through some of those trials. 
And while the outcomes are good, like I say, there is a bigger question about do we have the right to do that? But I haven't the time to answer that question. Just know that in those situations, in those trials, in those tests, any unnecessary harm that comes to the animals, anything that happens to animals that didn't need to happen for the sake of the experiment, at the very least, I hope we can all agree that that is another way for animals to be abused. That can also be considered the abuse of animals. So while we have those responsibility over the animals, like I say, we also have certain rights over them. We have the right to eat animals, to kill them and to eat them. We have the right to take some of their resources, for example, their wool or their milk or their eggs, and to use those for food and for other things as well. And we have the right to use them for labour, to use them on farms and so on. But animals are not just things. They are alive, they feel pain. They don't understand things to the level that we do, but they're not all completely stupid. Horses, for example, are quite intelligent creatures. Um, horses, for example, have been known to avoid walking on things that they're unsure about. So if a horse is on an unfamiliar bit of terrain, it mightn't walk where its rider wants it to walk unless someone walks out in front of it. And the reason for that is it knows if it walks on a dodgy bit of ground, it could hurt its leg. And if a horse's leg gets hurt, that's a death sentence. And horses are smart enough to have seen this and to have learned this and to know to be afraid to walk on something that could hurt their legs. And that, by the way, you've seen um, those videos of, do you know when people do the, the rainbow into the ground, like they'll, they'll paint a rainbow on a ground and a crosswalk or something and the horse won't walk on it? That's why. It's afraid. It doesn't recognise that bit of ground. It doesn't know if it's safe or not and so it won't walk on it unless it sees something else walk on it, demonstrating that it's safe. And other animals as well are quite intelligent. Again, not to the level of humans, but to a certain extent they are intelligent. They're not just big lumps of meat that are there for us. And while, like, like I say, we can eat them, we can use them for farming and for other things, they do deserve a certain amount of respect and dignity. Now we'll move on to verse 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And so here God is providing food for humans. He's speaking, like I say, to Adam and Eve, and he's providing them food. I want us to notice a few things here. First of all, we have a responsibility over plant life as well as animals. We have a responsibility to use the resources of the earth properly. It's the same with animals, by the way, I meant to say this. We look at fishing, for example. We have the right to fish. We have the right to eat the fish out of the seas. We do not have the right to empty the seas. We do not have the right to take every resource from the water. It's our responsibility to do it properly and responsibly. Fishing is fine, but overfishing and destroying ecosystems to the point where we're running out of fish pretty much, that's not fine. That's an irresponsible use of the gift and the privilege that God has given us. And I believe it is sinful to abuse these gifts and it is a slap in the face to God. We must be responsible with how we fish and how we take from the land. And the same is true with plants. And there are so many different ways again to abuse plants like with animals first of all we could use up all of the resources burn down all the forests build, you know take the trees build stuff with them but not replant anything get rid of all the plants we rely on for oxygen and food and so on but that's not the only way to abuse plants you have certain plants that can be used as drugs and other substances as well that can be used for drugs for example marijuana something like morphine now, these are drugs that can be used in proper contexts and proper settings. A doctor might prescribe medical marijuana in certain cases. Hospitals use morphine to help patients who are in pain. But these are drugs that people get addicted to. 
And so while a proper use, and really the only proper use for these is in the medical setting where a doctor has looked at you and decided that you need this for whatever reason, while using these resources properly is fine, abusing these resources is not fine. Getting addicted to them and usually that leads to pain not just for yourself but for those around you. You could die of an overdose of certain drugs. You could become a different person due to the use of drugs. You would hurt the people around you. You could make bad decisions. You could decide to go for a drive, not thinking properly, end up getting in a crash and hurt someone else. When we abuse the resources that God has given us, the consequences are disastrous, not just in terms of drugs, but in other things. Again, with the ecosystem, with all other plants and animals, when we abuse them and use them all up, so that there's nothing left for anybody else that has disastrous consequences on us, on other people, on the environment, everything. These are God's gift to us, but they come with responsibilities, privileges and responsibilities. And we must recognise that and be grateful to God and give thanks to God for that. And one way to give thanks to God is to recognise those responsibilities and act them out. Something else to recognise in plants is that plants are beautiful. So many plants are beautiful to look at. They're wonderful to look at. They are often used in homes for decoration. We recognise when we look out at sprawling grassy hills and other such areas, we recognise the beauty of trees and bushes and so on. Because God is a wonderful and brilliant creator, his creations are beautiful to behold. As well as that, at this point in time, in the Garden of Eden, it seems that every plant was good for food. Every single one. Now, not every plant today is good for food. If you're walking down a boreen in Ireland, um, you'll probably have bushes on either side of you. You can't just reach into one, grab some food and eat it. A lot of them don't grow food that we would even recognise as being possible to eat. They don't grow fruits. And the, a lot of the ones that do grow fruits, those fruits can't be eaten by us. They're poisonous, they might make us sick, they might kill us. There are certain plants, I believe, for example, in Australia. I'm, I'm going to say Australia because that's where all the dangerous stuff tends to be. In Australia, there's a plant called the Gimpy Gimpy. And it's it stings like a nettle, but its sting is so painful that horses who get stung by it have been known to throw themselves into water in order to drown themselves in order to stop the pain. And people have been known to do the same as well. It's one of the most painful things imaginable and it comes from a plant. And there are other plants like poison ivy, nettles, thistles and so on. And certain types of berries that we can't eat. But this wasn't the case in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden all food was good. And all, or sorry, all plants were good for food, excuse me. So what changed? Well, there was the fall. If we go to chapter 3 and verse 18, it says, Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. Thorns and thistles here, are. this is the first example of a plant which is not good for food. This is the first example of a plant which cannot be useful to people and cannot be used um, for food and to be eaten. Now, I don't know if this was the beginning of all dangerous plants or if all other dangerous plants developed later and at this point it was just thorns and thistles. But things like the gimpy gimpy and poisonous berries and other dangerous plants, they came about as a result of the fall, as a result of sin and its curse upon the earth. And I believe that when it comes time for us to go to the new earth and to heaven, there will be plant life on, in heaven. And in the new earth. And that plant uh, life, all those plants, will be good for food once more. And I believe that the, while now in Ireland you can't walk down a boring and just see a bush on either side and just pick up a bit of food from it and eat it. Once we are in the new earth, I believe that would be possible. To go for a walk in the wilderness and to just see a bush or a tree and for them all to have food and all to be beautiful. And for you to be able to just take a bit of food and to be able to eat it. And have no worry and no fear of it being poisoned or being dangerous in any way. There'll be no fear of 
rubbing up against the wrong plant that might sting you or give you a rash. All plants would be beautiful and all plants would be good for food as it was before the fall in the garden. Now we go on to verse 30, it says, And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. So it was not only the humans who were eating the plants at this stage, but also the animals. Now this suggests that there was no, uh, no carnivores at this stage. And that is a fairly common belief in evangelical circles today that um, Adam and Eve were vegetarians and that they didn't eat meat. Now, while this is not explicitly stated in the text, that does seem to be the implication. When God talks about plants here, he talks about them as food. He is giving them to people as food. But that same thing never applies to animals. And when God is talking about the animals as well, by the way, or giving food to the animals, he mentions plants. He says here, plants are for animals to eat, as well as humans. So it seems like at this stage, there were no carnivores. There were no omnivores. A carnivore is someone who eats meat, um, not only, but mostly. So uh, there's no such thing as a true carnivore, by the way, because certain, basically an animal would eat anything if it's desperate enough. So a carnivore will eat plants and an omnivore, well, an omnivore eats anything. A uh, herbivore, herbivores have been known to eat, other animals have been known to eat meat if they're desperate enough. But generally speaking, a carnivore will eat meat, a herbivore will eat plants, and an omnivore will eat either. Now humans, as we are now, are omnivores. We can eat either. And there are some animals that are mainly carnivores and some that are mainly herbivores. But it seems that at this point in the Garden of Eden, there were just herbivores. Or at least that's the implication. When God talks about the animals, he talks about how we have dominion over them. But he doesn't talk about how they are there for us to eat. Now, whether or not we ate any animal products, we drank their milk, ate their eggs or whatever, I don't know. But it seems like, the at the very least, the preferred option at this point in time was for us to eat the plants and not the animals. But this changed after the fall. In fact, one of the first things we see after the fall is God killing an animal in order to give its hide to Adam and Eve. And this, is, of course, represents how Christ would later die on the cross and his blood would wash away all of our sins and his righteousness would cover us and cover our sins so that while we are not righteous, we can be forgiven because we are covered by his sins, just as the death of that animal became necessary to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve after the fall. So too was the death of Christ on the cross necessary to cover our sins and our shame of our sins after the fall. But as it stands now, all animals seem to just be herbivores. And I believe there will be animals in heaven. And I believe that they will be herbivores. I do not believe there will be any sort of death in heaven. I do not believe that there will be animals killing animals or people killing animals. And I believe that we will be able to walk in the wilderness amongst animals that on earth would have tore either us or each other apart. And we will be able to live with them peacefully. We will be able to stand beside bears and tigers and lions with no fear at all and eat berries with them and so on. At least that's what I'm gathering from this. That's my belief. I believe the new earth will be similar, though not exactly the same, to the Garden of Eden. There'll be obvious things like, for example, we won't be married on the new earth or in heaven. We won't bear children. But I believe that apart from those things, most of what we see in the Garden of Eden will be replicated in the new earth. Because the Garden of Eden was how it was meant to be on earth. The Garden of Eden was how it was supposed to be. This wonderful paradise. And so it makes sense that when we get another shot in the new earth, it will once again be how it was supposed to be. And so there will be no death, either amongst the animals or amongst people. And there'll be no people killing animals. Though we may still have a certain amount of dominion over them. We may still use cows for their milk. We may still use chickens for their eggs. We may use sheep for their wool. 
we may use donkeys to pull along ploughs to farm the land. We, I believe, will still have a certain amount of dominion over them, but I don't believe we will kill them. I don't believe we will eat them. And people also sometimes ask, do animals go to heaven? Like I said, I believe there will be animals in heaven. I don't know where these animals will come from. It's possible that these animals are a whole new set of animals and that an animal on earth that dies just dies and that's the end of it. Or it's possible that an animal on earth that dies does go to heaven. There's nothing really in the Bible that suggests that an animal can go to heaven. Um, but there's nothing I believe in the Bible that outright states that it's impossible. I don't necessarily believe that animals do go to heaven. It's a nice thought, but, but I don't necessarily believe that it's true. So it's possible that we will have pets in heaven, but I, I don't think you should be holding out hope if one of your pets has passed away. Um, unfortunately, I don't think there's any hope that you will see them again. Maybe, maybe you will. And if that's something that you want to hope for, I can't really give you a biblical reason why you shouldn't. But I can't tell you without um, all certainty that you will see pets that have died again. That's really just for every individual to come to their own conclusion on that. Because like I say, it's just not something I guess that God thought was important enough to answer. It's not one of those questions that God felt the need to answer in the Bible. And so all we can do for the time being is speculate. But we will know one day. Now finally we will move on to the final verse in this chapter, verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Now, so far, after God has finished the creation, he will say, it is good, it is good, it is good. But now there's a deviation from that pattern. Now he's saying it is very good. Because now creation is complete and it exists as it is supposed to. It exists as it is intended to. You've got the people, you've got the plants and you've got the animals. The people use the plants and the animals in their own way. The um, animals... They have dominion over and the plants they use for food and the plants can also be used for food for the animals. There doesn't seem to be any semblance of death or destruction yet. All of that is unfortunately yet to come. So this is how it is intended to be. Now I want to go over once again some of the um, things that people say about Genesis chapter 1, some of the arguments they try to bring about, I, sort of against it without being against it. It's like they want it before Genesis, but not as it actually is. So they try to change it to be something else, so that way they can be for it. First of all, the idea that this is all a thousand years, because the Bible says a thousand years to the Lord is like a day, and a day like a thousand years. While the Bible does say that, there's nothing in the context of either, either that passage or this passage to suggest that that applies to this. This is simply people seeing the word day in a context where they don't want it to mean day and so deciding that it means something else. There is no reason to believe that the you know thousand day thousand years is like a day passage applies to Genesis 1. It doesn't apply. If you go into Genesis 1 with just pure exegesis, just reading it and trying to understand it, you don't get that out of it. It has to be eisegesis. You have to go into it and try and put it in there because you won't find it there naturally. So I believe the days are actual days. And I believe this is backed up by what the text says. Because at the end of every day, it says it was evening and it was morning the next day. Or whatever day is next, the fifth day, the sixth day, and so on. Because that's how days work. They have the evening and then the morning and it's the start of a new day. People have said this is poetry. I don't believe this is poetry. I believe this is a way to show that this chapter is literal. This isn't a period of thousands and thousands of years. This is a period of a day. Thousands and thousands of years don't have one evening and one morning. They have thousands and thousands. But one day has one evening and one morning. So this is simply a day. And then another possible um, argument that people make is that it's all allegory. Now there are allegories in the Bible. There are parable, uh, parables and stories. And in the Psalms, the Psalms is just a collection of psalms and songs and um, poems. So a lot of the stuff in there is allegory. It's not literal. And Proverbs as well. It is allegorical wisdom. For example, you know, the, the famous one, spare not the child the rod, 
doesn't mean beat your child for every minor inconvenience. It means make sure your child is uh, properly disciplined. So there is allegory in the Bible, but there isn't allegory all over the Bible and it isn't just sprinkled about willy-nilly in random places. We have to look at the genre. Genesis's genre is historical. The claims it makes are historical claims. Now, there may well be allegory in there in certain instances for certain purposes. But usually, whenever there is allegory in there, it's fairly clear why it's allegorical. It's, it's very clear that it's allegorical and it's very clear what the allegory is and what it's trying to say. For example, when it says, you know, the two should become one flesh. That is very clearly an allegory for marriage. It's not literal. We shan't literally become one flesh. But you can't just look at any part of Genesis you don't like and say, well, if it's literal, that kind of bothers me. So I guess it must be allegorical. That's not exegesis, that's eisegesis. Exegesis going to the text, by the way, and taking stuff out of this, out of it. Eisegesis is going to the text and putting stuff in. Now, why do people try and do this? Why Genesis specifically do people target like this? Well, it's because of Genesis's claims of creation, which go against the modern day claim of evolution. Now, sometimes people, and I've heard good biblical teachers give this answer, but I've never liked this answer, what I'm about to tell you, and I'll tell you why. Now, the answer, for, for this, for evolution and that, sometimes I've heard people say, Genesis is theological, it's not a scientific textbook. Now the problem with that is that it's a non-answer designed to sound like a smart answer. Because it doesn't really answer anything. I mean, think about it. Genesis is here making a claim about creation that goes against the modern theory of evolution. You can't then say, oh, it's a theology textbook, not a, or it's a theology book, not a science textbook. It doesn't matter. It's making a claim about a particular thing. Just because it doesn't happen to be in that genre doesn't mean it's no longer making that claim. Genesis is making the claim that Adam and Eve were real people and that the creation week really happened and so on. So even though it's not a scientific genre, it still goes against the modern science. Now, I have a fairly controversial view on evolution in terms of both evolutionists and creationists. My view is that evolution is real, but that the creation story is also true. I do not believe Adam and Eve evolved. I believe that they were created on the sixth day. I do not believe there were billions of years where there were no humans in existence. I believe there were five days. I do not believe evolution played the part in our history and in our origin that modern day scientists claim it does. I do not believe evolution was the cause of humanity. However, I do believe in evolution, the ongoing process that we see today. I mentioned fish earlier. An example of evolution, if you take two fish, the exact same type of fish, you put one in one lake and another in another lake, you wait a few generations, you come back, there will be very slight differences. That's evolution. Those very slight differences are a result of the very slight differences in their environment. That's evolution and process. And people talk about microevolution and macroevolution. Micro meaning small and macro meaning big. The only difference between micro and macro evolution is time. Because macro evolution is nothing more than a long series of micro evolutions. Think of it this way. People often think of evolution as a dinosaur becoming a chicken. But what it actually is is a dinosaur staying as a dinosaur. It just gets small bit smaller bit smaller, bit smaller, over the course of millions of years until eventually it's about the size of a chicken and maybe it starts getting feathers and so on. There's no point where it stops being a dinosaur and starts being a chicken. There's no point where you can look at it and say, okay, this is the chicken, but it's, its parents weren't chickens, they were dinosaurs. That's not how evolution works. It's a series of small changes. You start with one thing, you end with something different, but in between, there is no point that you can look at and say, okay, this is where the change occurs because the change occurs all over. So I believe in evolution, micro and macro evolution. I believe that both are possible. And I believe that given enough time, if humanity lives another three or four billion years, 
we will see the results of evolution. However, as I've said, I do not believe that evolution has played the role in our past and in our history and in the history of the world that modern day scientists claim it does. And uh, look, some people are going to maybe claim that I'm buckling to the pressure of the world. Some people are maybe going to claim that I'm, you know, giving in um, and all of that. But just ask yourselves this. Can you imagine Richard Dawkins or Neil deGrasse Tyson or any of them hearing me say that I believe the Earth is only a few thousand years old? I don't know how old, but it's probably just a few thousand years and that Adam and Eve are real people and that the events of Genesis were real and hear me defending them do you think those people would respect me anymore because i say evolution is a current ongoing process i don't i doubt that very much i doubt they would i doubt anyone would i'm not doing this because i'm buckling to pressure i'm not saying this because i'm compromised i'm saying this because this is the genuine viewpoint i've come to from my study of scripture and from my study of the world and not just my view of the world I don't believe evolution is in the Bible. When I say I've come to this conclusion from my study of scripture, I mean I'm a creationist because of my study of scripture. And I believe in the ongoing process of evolution in some form or another because of the evidence I have seen in the world around me. But with everything, of course, I'm open to being proven wrong. Just know that there is no space in Genesis, whatever your view on evolution is, there is no space in Genesis for billions and billions of billions of years, where there were no humans, no nothing. Genesis says what it says. We cannot hide from that fact, and we cannot be embarrassed by it.